We feel really lucky that uh, you were willing to be so flexible in your time, right? It's the evening for you, and it's it's just the morning, 10 a.m. for us. Yes. Would, would you like to, to see our, our class or meet anyone? Okay. Sure. We'll, we'll go around. It's okay. Okay. All right. Hi, Dave. <laughs> My name Hello. is... We are the first year graduate students in graduate school of education, majoring in educational leadership. And that's my baby. She will <laughs> listen to your lecture too. Our research interests are women leadership and work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Aigun, and um, nice to see you. for Pakistani students. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good evening. So my name is Ruyar. Uh, so my research interest is about uh, mass of online courses and its benefits for higher education. So mm -hmm. great. And hello, my name is Asimu. My topic is uh, research capacity and which factors increase the growth. Okay. Uh, my name is Amadur, and my interest is Brain circulation and Kazakhstani higher education students who have returned from other countries. <laughs> Great. Okay. My name is yeah. Hello, my name is Sejan. How are you doing? Fine. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for giving us a lecture today. Hello, my name is Albina. Uh, nice to meet you, and uh, I, I, I want to do, study the research topic uh, faculty involvement in the governance system. Mm. Uh -huh. Hello, my name is Akmaral, and I'm also the graduate student of the university. And I'm going to study the role of 21st century skills in teaching English. Hello, okay. uh, nice to meet you. My name is Ludmila. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm interested in the leadership skills, so soft skills, and uh, uh, their connection with employability of students. So this is my research topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, we may have another some other people coming in, but for right now, we're we're good to go. Whenever you're ready, if you have any questions for us. No, I thought I'd go ahead and what we wanted to do about half an hour, right? That's great. Yeah, because I know you're getting close to the end of your course, and so I want you to have plenty of time with the students. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about some possible new directions for focus groups. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you had a chance to show the students the list of things that I uh, had, had thought about talking on. Uh, what I think is that we've come up with a very successful formula for doing focus groups and we don't tend to deviate from that formula much. So it's a tricky question. When you have something that works, do you uh, stick with what you know and is likely to work or when do you take some chances, risks and innovate and try something different? And what I put together was kind of a list of the way that people typically do focus groups that works. And it starts with the idea that we really have a predetermined notion of who we're going to interview, what questions we're going to ask them, and that doesn't change throughout. So we sort of design it to begin with and stick with that design. That's one thing I wanted to talk about. And then in part of that design is usually that we use homogeneous groups so that everyone has a lot of similarity to each other and that facilitates the conversation. Another thing is that when we do the focus groups, we just bring the people in once and they participate in the group and then that's it. And we usually work with groups of a typical size, which is about five to ten people and we haven't experimented much beyond that. When we talk to them, we usually use what we call semi-structured interviews, and we often do that in what we call a funnel format. So the funnel format starts with broad, open-ended questions and then moves into more uh, narrow, uh, directed questions. So let me check in and make sure that the transmission's coming through okay. 
Okay. Can y'all hear okay? Yeah. You can. Okay. So it's pretty stable. You can hear me. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, so I wanted to rethink some of those things. I mean, if that's what works most of the time, then, you know, it's sort of like we've come up with a really good formula, but are we relying too heavily on that formula? And the first part of that is the predetermined notion of who we're going to talk to and what questions we're going to ask them. Because often when we, you know, start off with beginning uh, introductory stuff on qualitative research, we say that you really ought to be more emergent and that you ought to uh, alternate data collection and data analysis so that you can learn things as you're listening to people and then modify your approach so that there's a more fluid, less structured, uh, less predetermined aspect of qualitative research. But then it turns out that all too often we write our questions, we choose our participants, and then we just stick with that and never go back and do anything to modify our interview questions. I think that's particularly true in focus groups. So we set up everything in the beginning. And the alternative that I'm thinking of is to break the groups up into sets and change things in between. So let's say you do two groups with your initial questions, and then you think about, well, some of those questions didn't work as well as I wanted them to, or I've heard new things that I didn't anticipate asking about. How can I build that kind of change into my next two groups and do better research by continually letting the topics emerge? The same thing goes with regard to who the participants are in the sense that um, you start off with a notion of who you want to hear from, but that could evolve over the course of the research, and you might do your first half based on one set of sampling and recruitment criteria and then change that for the second half. I think those are real possibilities that people haven't looked into much. Instead, we sort of put the research into motion at the beginning and follow it all the way through. And to my mind, uh, qualitative research gives you a lot more flexibility than that. If you're doing a survey, you stick with the same questions, you stick with the same sample. But if you're doing a qualitative study, you can take what you learn from the first parts of the study and then build on that to make some revisions for the later part. So that's one thing that I'm really advocating we should think about more with regard to focus groups. Okay. So I can go through the list kind of one at a time, or I can take reactions from you or anyone else. Sure. Should we wait till the end till we have questions or? I actually, I have a question for you. And so yeah. immediately what I started to think about is, so in this context right now in Kazakhstan, we're just starting to develop any kind of ethics boards at all. So we've talked about ethics oh, yeah. a lot, and sure. really it's our university that is making this change. And so some of the things that we've confronted is if you have non-traditional research, so like what you're proposing would be kind of considered non-traditional, right? So your sample, how do you explain that your sample is going to change or that your uh, questions will change? So well, within the for procedures that we typically use in the U.S., it's possible to have an amendment or update approved to your ethics request. So you put in a beginning request and say, this is a starting point, and if we make changes, we'll request permission. And typically, that kind of secondary review goes pretty quickly if you're working with relatively similar kinds of people on relatively similar kinds of questions. So unless you make big changes, um, we usually would have a full review for the first um, proposal and then what's called an expedited review for the second. Okay, that makes sense because I was initially imagining trying to put it all within the initial review and then explaining that it, your participants might change and your questions might change and how that would be interpreted. So instead, right. it's a straightforward initial application and then if anything changes, then an amendment, which usually is quick. Right. Yeah. Um, our university really encourages that. They have a word for it. I don't know how common it is elsewhere, and I'll have to explain it because it is a kind of a, a cultural usage, but they call it a blanket form of application. 
as in putting several things under a blanket and having them all covered. Mm -hmm. So you start with the initial application as the blanket and then have shorter supplementary applications if you have related research that is continuing the original. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The next thing I had on my list was this idea of homogeneous versus heterogeneous groups. And homogeneous means with regard to the topic. So these are all people who uh, share a similar relationship to the topic, and that makes it easier for them to talk to each other about it. But what do you do when you've got a variety of people who have different ways of relating to the topic? How do you bring them together into a group? And the answer is that we don't really know, <laughs> okay? Uh, it works so well to have similar people together talking about sort of shared experiences that we tend to almost not use focus groups unless we can meet that criteria. And how you work with a more heterogeneous or mixed kind of group, we don't know. The people all had to have some uh, interest in, and experience with the topic, but what if they have rel relatively different kinds of interests and experiences? Um, you guys are working with uh, educational settings, so you obviously have uh, administrators, teachers, parents, students. Would, we wouldn't know how to bring together members of those different groups. Okay, we might be able to do something like teachers of younger students and teachers of older students because they're all teachers and we could compare their, they could compare their experiences as teachers. Even then, we'd probably break them apart into separate groups and hear what the younger uh, grades teachers would say and the older grades teachers. We might be able to mix that, but in general, we don't have uh, procedures for doing mixed or heterogeneous groups. And I, you know, th this probably goes back deep into the history of focus groups and further than we need to talk about today. But um, again, it's something that we found really works well. If people can talk to others who have similar kinds of experiences, then they can really uh, get a good conversation going. But we haven't figured out how to get people to talk together around differences. And it's not like we've failed, it's more like we haven't tried. And so again, if you think about this, if you're starting out to design your research and you say, gee, I've got a choice here, I could bring together people who sort of represent different positions and I wouldn't really know how to ask the questions or moderate the group. But if I brought together people who were very similar, then that would be easy. Then we tend to take the easy way. And so I think there's a lot of potential in working with groups that have uh, interesting comparisons between the participants built in, but it's something that people just have not developed yet. Okay, so that's my number two. I don't know how uh, that would fit in with anything that you guys are doing. Think. Any questions about that? Or thoughts about so right? So typically, right, the focus group, all the same kind of people. And instead, right, to think about having different types, having different stakeholders all at the same table talking about a topic. Yeah, so the, Yeah, so it could be students and faculty all together. So, uh, so I could interview in a, in a focus group, all the, so like one faculty member, maybe one administrator could be in the focus group, one student, graduate student, one undergraduate student. And usually you don't see a focus group that's like that. Usually the focus groups are just undergraduate students or just graduate students and maybe just graduate in education, right? It would, so a very specific. And so then what Dr. Morgan is saying is that there's this possibility and Something that we that hasn't really been explored to be able to think about and see what it is that we can learn from that. The, the, the individual people know, right? That don't do the, the research themselves. This would be so you would go into the research 
And so you would be asking them questions, right? What are your, your thoughts about soft skills, right? Or what are your experiences with soft skills? Tell me about, you probably wouldn't say soft skills because it's not a common term, but you would ask them about leadership, right? Maybe, do you want to ask something? No, okay. Okay, you'll ask. Okay, I'll clarify one thing. Okay. Yeah, about, for example, if I can't, like uh, you said, like graduate students, yeah, but what if I want to uh, have open group, for example, people who are in the middle positions, for okay. example, what would be the basis? Because it will be also like checking. A heterogeneous, so would it be heterogeneous focus group then to have, if you want to look at leadership skills, and that you have different types of leaders from different organizations? Like manager. And the president of the company, would that then be considered heterogeneous? That if we had, say, all managers from different companies, that would be the common approach. If we had people who are at different levels of management, then that would be what we'd call a mixed group. Okay. You could think about, right? So would it be advantageous to have different levels? Could you learn about leadership skills by doing not just leaders, but also or different levels of leadership or those who are aspiring to be leaders, right? That you might get something else from, from the interaction, right? Right, yeah. Both, you know, okay, all right. So, still, all right. so then the question is, is it still effective for the research either to have a mixed group or to have a homogeneous group? Well, we know it's gonna be easier to do if we have a homogeneous group. We just don't, haven't developed the skills we need yet for doing mixed groups. So I think it could be a powerful kind of design. We could think of uh, really interesting kinds of conversations that might occur, but we have to think about how to ask questions that everybody will be able to sort of talk to each other in the room about that. Mm -hmm. So the classic sort of thing in a focus group is that, the participants really need to be able to relate to each other and be interested in what each other has to say. And if they all come from slightly different stakeholder positions uh, with regard to the question, then we have to think about how to ask them something to talk about, particularly in the beginning, that um, each one will find it easy to answer and everyone else will find it interesting what they have to say. And that's easy to do when the people all have a lot in common, but we don't have the kind of experience we need to think about how to do that when the people come from relatively different uh, starting points. So if we wanted to do a heterogeneous focus group, what would you suggest to be, how would we develop those skills? Yeah, well, I wish I could say that because I like to talk out of experience yeah. and okay. speculation. But I would put a lot of emphasis on the first question. How do, I sometimes call that a discussion starter question. And so we say, you know, how do we come up with something that meets those two kind of criteria I just mentioned? On the one hand, it's easy for everyone to answer. And on the other hand, the other people will be interested in what uh, everyone says. Mm -hmm. So we would have to find a question that somehow unites their interests despite their differences. Hmm. And that might almost be a good way of testing whether the group is too heterogeneous. If you can't come up with a first question like that, then you might need to think about, well, do the group, do they have enough in common? Right. Okay. There's sometimes a, a phrase that's used more recently in focus groups is something called common ground. And again, it's sort of uh, English language usage, but it means do people have a way to stand together or recognize that they're all in the same place with regard to the topic? Mm -hmm. And so that's the key thing that we've got to have, that they have some way to recognize their shared interests in the topic. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be as much homogeneity, I think, as we've been using. People might relate to the same topic from different perspectives, from different standpoints, and find that interesting. Um, so how you exactly make that work, we don't know yet. Okay. 
And I imagine it would be more challenging with maybe the leadership, right? If you have more hierarchical differences that you're thinking about bringing together to find right. the common ground where people would want to, where the, the president of the university would want to hear from somebody lower, right? Maybe you find somebody right. that's unique and wants to. One thing you have to watch specifically is when you have the kind of hierarchy where one person has authority over another. We usually try to avoid that because then the person in the lower position will be afraid to take them in front of their uh, manager. Yeah. So we might have managers from one, a manager from one business, a uh, president from another, uh, an aspiring leader from a third, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe different divisions within the same company. As long as there isn't some one-to-one -one supervisory relationship, we try to avoid that. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, the next thing I've got on my list is that we do a lot of so-called, or do you want, does somebody else have an idea? Yeah, there, one more. Okay, go. I want to ask about incentives. For example, if I want to do a focus group with five or six people, should I invite them to have lunch together or just to pay for that? Yeah. Um, incentives? Well, that's a tricky thing in terms of you have to watch the word incentive because for some focus group researchers, that automatically means money. Uh, how much are you going to pay them to attend? And uh, I say the incentive is anything that will motivate them to show up. And sometimes that's talking to other people about a shared interest. So if it's a topic that the people are really uh, highly engaged with, then they probably will be interested in talking to their peers. And so just the chance to talk might be an incentive. The other thing we do is if you want to get five or six people to show up, we'd invite something like seven or eight. And that way, if a couple of people don't show up, then we have enough. But what, we also spend a lot of time uh, making sure that people understand how important it is for them to attend um, and how much we appreciate the fact that they're going to help us. And so we're essentially asking for people to be volunteers. And then we have to think about, well, what's going to motivate them to volunteer? How do we encourage them to follow through with their initial saying yes? Maybe calling people back the night before. So we usually have a lot of uh, effort on recruitment. And you probably saw that in the one article on why things sometimes go wrong. And incentives are one way to solve that problem, uh, but also sort of careful planning and continual contact with the participants is another thing that's really helpful. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's going to be even more the case with the next thing I was going to talk about is that usually when we do a focus group, we have the people come in, they talk, they go away, that's that what we call a one-shot focus group. What if we wanted to have people come back and talk to us again? And so people are really working with this now that they call repeated groups or reconvened groups. Now, it's very difficult to bring the same, say, five or six people back together, but if you did a half dozen focus groups the first time around, then you've got 30 or more people that you could recruit into a second round of focus groups that would be kind of blended out of the first set of participants. So you might do four groups the next time, and each group would have somebody from different groups in the first round. So you take your first round as a pool that you would draw from to put together your second round. And sometimes, particularly when you're working with a topic that people may not be that familiar with or haven't uh, thought about as deeply, the first round of focus groups exposes them to their thinking. They literally express themselves and hear the range of thoughts that other people have. And um, in essence, it sort of uh, changes them in ways that might be interesting to hear about a week or so later by bringing uh, people back together. So that's a design that I'm seeing used more often now, these repeated or reconvened focus groups. Mm -hmm. So 
in terms of doing something new or different, you could definitely think of that as uh, something that is, is being experimented with now. And I've seen, you know, maybe a half dozen publications with that. Um, I should say, by the way, in terms of number of publications in that uh, 1995 uh, annual review overview article I gave you, I think I said that they, we had found something like uh, 100 articles a year. That's more like uh, 1,000, 2,000 articles a year using focus groups now. So it's become an extremely popular method. So when I say I've seen six articles, uh, that's out of uh, searching and searching through a lot of articles to find those. And so it really is uh, what we would call kind of cutting edge or newly uh, developing technique to bring people back for these repeated or reconvened groups. So anytime you think that there might be some kind of um, kind of a developmental process whereby exposing them to the ideas and getting them to work hard with thinking about them would lead them to really kind of develop new ideas or new insights, um, then the repeated groups can be useful. Also, if something happens, of course, so that it's almost like an experimental design where you know they're going to go through a class or a training or something like that, and you do some groups beforehand and afterwards, then that's a natural kind of pre-post um, sort of design. That, I think, would be the simplest kind of repeated group. Do you find, so if you have a short amount of time or a limited amount of time. So you're doing the research for master's thesis students, right? So in this case, so maybe you have about a semester. If you're yeah. going to have focus groups, what time, and I'm sure it, it all, I know, depends on the question, what you're looking for, but what have you found maybe in these six articles that say the, um, the amount of time between focus groups? So like that processing that people need or different information that would come in? Right. Well, I think um, a month is about the longest I've seen, and otherwise a week or two. Um, I'll give you an example of one that I think went a month. They were working with people about uh, their beliefs about natural resources, environmentalism, and the concept of sustainability. What does sustainability mean? Well, that's what they asked them the first time around. What does sustainability mean? And they spent, you know, the typical hour and a half exploring what that meant to them. Then the next groups, they asked them really more in-depth questions about how sustainability would apply in this situation or that situation. So it's kind of like... Um, to take an abstract concept like that that was meaningful to the people. They were involved in environmentalism, uh, but that they hadn't thought about that much. And then get them, so let's, uh, you mentioned something I don't know much about earlier, something you called soft skills. Oh, okay, God. so suppose you go out to people where that's a relevant topic. They may have heard the label, but they haven't thought about it much. Mm -hmm. Then get them to think and talk about soft skills and then come back some time later and get into it in more depth and detail. So a lot of times that depth and detail is what you want, but people don't have a well enough developed thought pattern to respond to that. In psychology, there's a phrase where people are uh, schematic about something. Yeah, they can immediately bring up a well-developed thought pattern and relate to the question and tell you their thoughts and experiences and feelings about it. Well, if people haven't got that, uh, you can develop it for them in a first round of groups and then get into it in that second round. I use the expression there, depth and detail, and that's something that you can really get in focus groups. I think they're used more often in exploratory purposes where we, you know, don't know as much and we want to hear what participants have to tell us from their experiences and their world. So we're exploring and learning, but 
I think we can turn that around and say that they can be exploring and learning too in one set of groups and then go into that other kind of benefit of qualitative stuff, not just exploratory, but depth and detail. And you know, that can be hard to hear about if people aren't immediately able to respond to a topic and say, oh yes, I know how that works in my job, or oh yeah, I've had that happen to me. Um, if they aren't really ready to jump up and explain everything about that part of their lives, then a two-stage group or repeated group might be useful. Makes sense. All right, you want to tell me? All right, so one second. Okay. Okay. okay, so clarifying, I think, right with the focus groups, right? So yes. the first research group, so then this is about the soft skills, that maybe you would ask them something general about it, right? What do they, how do they define soft skills, or what do they, what do they think about it in general? And so that could be for the first hour and a half, right, yes. the focus group. And then the next week, now that they've already, they're familiar with you and with each other, then you could ask them more details yes. about it. Uh, yeah. About their leadership school skills and how it relates. Yes. Is, it correct? Is that correct, right, that you yeah. would have that more general and then go into the specific, right? Yeah. yeah. You can even give them a little bit of homework in the sense of saying that, now that we've talked about this and you're going to be coming back next week, could you look and watch and see, almost mentally keep a diary of where soft skills fits into what you're doing, and then we can all have conversations about uh, examples and experiences next time. That's nice, right? So you're then preparing them for what's going to come, what you're going to talk about, for, what, for them to think about during that time frame. Do right. In general, during your focus groups, that so one of the challenges I've, I've seen is recording, recording all the information, right? So across multiple people, so either you're trying to take notes or you're taking notes and transcribing, and then ultimately maybe you try to transcribe everything, but you have people talking over each other. Is, mm -hmm. Do you have a particular technique that, that you recommend? Uh, I use a stereo digital recorder, but a fairly simple one might cost uh, $50 US. Um, anything more expensive than that is just being used for high fidelity in music. So uh, the stereo separates out one side of the room versus the other. And so I can hear distinctly who's talking. Um, I do make notes, but I don't tend to use them very much. I tend to rely on the transcript of what people said. That way I can be paying more attention to the participants and thinking about uh, what they're doing as a group, paying attention to their conversation and group dynamics. And then I know the tape, or well, that's old fashioned. The recorder is going to capture everything that I have to hear and use later. If I think it's going to be a particularly active or lively conversation, I'll use two recorders, one at one end of the table and the other at the other end of the table. And so getting that stereo separation of left and right, the two recorders for near and far away, I can get all the information I need. It's usually not that difficult, particularly if in the instructions you emphasize to people that you want them to take turns. And then if the group starts getting kind of chaotic, say, let's slow down for a second because we need to be able to take turns. Um, you know, that people tend to be pretty responsive to that because they want to hear each other too. Yeah. And so they have as an interest in maintaining a reasonably orderly discussion just like you do. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Well, that gets into the size of the group, which I was going to talk about. Um, if we typically use something like, I think what I see in the social sciences, I said five to 10, 10 would be large. When we started doing these back in the 80s, we tended to run larger groups and group size has gotten smaller and smaller. 
because we find that uh, people can relate to each other better. They uh, give longer and more thoughtful kinds of responses, and they really have more time to talk to each other in a smaller group. Now, for a small group like five or four, I would want the people to really have a strong relationship to the topic, something they could really relate to easily and personally. Uh, larger groups, we tend to use them when the people are a little um, less personally involved with the topic, and then each one can contribute a little, and then that will build up and there'll be enough for everyone to talk. Mm -hmm. And so that would be, you know, size 8 to 10, as opposed to, say, 4, 5, or 6 at the low end. But I'm interested in smaller or larger groups than that. In particular, a lot of the work I've done lately is with two-person groups. And so how do we get a pair of people to talk to each other about the topic? And that's been one of my particular interests. There's been less work done at the larger end. What if the, you know, the only way you can really get people together is like, 15, 20 or so, how do we make that work? And so right now, I think it would still be pretty innovative to be doing two or three person focus groups. And again, we haven't developed the knowledge or skills yet for doing things in the 15 or 20 or larger range. So size is another area where I think there's some real possibility for doing things differently. So with the two person groups, how do you find that, what do you do differently? Well, again, I think in terms of that first question, and I think of it as they're going to build a temporary relationship during the interview, and so they kind of need to get acquainted. And so I think of a question that will make it easy for each person to sort of introduce themselves to the other person in terms of the topic. And then as they get to understand, uh, you know, how they relate to each other, then they can really build on that in the continuing conversation. I think of the focus group as having a group discussion, which has a somewhat different dynamic than a two-person conversation. But when you've got a topic, we've done some comparisons on either having two people or four or five people discuss the same topic. And the two-person conversations tend to be rather lively and, if anything, a little more productive than the actual focus groups. So this is an area where we sort of picked up the technique of focus groups and we may have overlooked the possibility, what I call dyadic two-person interviewing. So that's uh, something that really interests me. Um, one thing that's not on my list, but that I could mention here is uh, to do with online focus groups. And the most of the work that's been done previously on online focus groups use chat rooms or instant messaging or something like that. And there's been very little that uses something like what we're doing today with an actual video interview. And part of the reason for that is just the technology. I think it's only recently become stable enough. Um, uh, some of the articles I've seen, the total article is nothing but complaining about the problems they had with the technology. Um, and, you know, that's, that's useful to warn people, but it doesn't advance our practice. But one of the things we've seen is that in a two-person online group, it's exactly like an ordinary uh, video conversation. You've got the two, well, it's not exactly like, because we've got a moderator asking questions, but it's basically two people talking to each other. Each one has their image up on the screen, and it's fairly straightforward. When we have uh, four people, it really gets more complex to maintain that kind of group conversation in a video format and almost impossible to do it, I think, in a chat room or instant message format. Mm -hmm. The other option there, and I won't have time to talk about it, is to use something like a bulletin board or forum. So I don't know if you have a discussion board or something as part of your class. I heard somebody say that one of the things that interested them was online instruction. And 
that's not exactly the, it's not, it's not as close to the typical in-person focus group where everybody's talking to each other at the same time, but it is a way to get a multiple sets of people to all contribute to an ongoing discussion through a bulletin board or forum. I tried it through a, a Facebook group. And so a secret group that just had, it had four people, right? So they were involved in all, so asynchronous so that people could post whenever they wanted. They were across the world. Their mothers also it, working in academia. So their timing was not always perfect, right? That you have a child and you can't respond or just sit right in front of the video. And instead, you could then respond in the Facebook group. And sometimes people would respond to each other uh, frequently, and then other times they would just respond to the question and not really to one another. And so it's definitely something that can be explored more, as you're saying. Right. And I don't think you mentioned the magic word asynchronous versus synchronous. So synchronous is when you're going to have everybody present at the same time, like we're doing now. And asynchronous is when anybody can kind of log in anytime they want to and read the questions and the discussion. There isn't much known in that last regard about moderating these bulletin boards. The tendency has been to just put up a question and let people respond to the question and hopefully uh, discuss what each other has said. Uh, but the, the issue of what might be more of a moderator's role in a asynchronous board type thing is it just hasn't been explored. Uh, the idea is that if you ask good questions and get good participants, it'll take care of itself. It's kind of a passive approach more than a moderated approach. I can say actually the biggest challenge that I had was trying to figure out how much to respond myself. And so then if somebody posted something, then am I trying to encourage other people to say things or one person says something, do I then try to respond, oh, that's a very interesting, tell me more, or what do other people think, or I have a similar experience or not. And so especially in the asynchronous, yeah. it was a challenge, right? Or something that at least I was constantly thinking about. Right. That's always a challenge for the moderator because you sort of want to be interested in what people are saying, but you don't want to sound like you're more interested in one point of view than another. You yeah. don't want to make it sound like, oh, tell me more about the kinds of things that you're talking about. In essence, the participants want to know what you're interested in. They'd like you to make it easy for them by showing interest in some things and giving them real clear picture, uh, whereas you're often wanting to hear everything they have to say and you want to encourage a wide range of different points of view. Yeah. And so, I tell them in the beginning that we want to hear a lot of people talk about all kinds of different things. And then my response is in the focus group, the thing I'm most likely to say is something like, what else? What haven't we heard yet? Who has something different? Uh, wow, we've heard a lot of good things. What else can you sell me? So that's I'm always trying to broaden the discussion rather and I'm always a little careful that if I say something they're going to you know jump on that as what I really want to hear about yeah yeah that makes sense yeah well that that also goes into we're getting into sort of the last things I had on my list were this idea of what we call semi-structured interviews which I'm never quite sure what that means we use it all the time in qualitative methods and what we mean, of course, is we aren't doing. Surveys, which on. So we've got something that the interview that there's some structure to it, but not a whole lot. And so it's, it's pretty vague. What I like to do is to find ways to run focus groups so that the participants are really spending most of their time talking to each other um and not rambling on but really talking about the things i want to hear about so i call that a less structured interview um to me if the participants are talking about the things i want to hear about that's good data and i don't feel like i need to be really active as a moderator to produce that data necessarily if i ask 
interesting questions to people who are interested in the topic, then uh, I may not have to do very much. My dream focus group would be where I could just ask them one question and they could talk endlessly about all the things I want to hear about. And at the end, I could, uh, you know, sort of say, wow, that's really great. Let's capture or let's summarize by hearing, uh, you know, maybe one final question. We like to wrap up the focus groups, like wrapping up a package. And so I would maybe ask one initial question and one final question. Um, and the final question would probably be something like, I want each of you to tell me one important thing you want me to remember. You've talked about all kinds of things today, but let's make sure I know what's important to each of you. So go around the table now, one at a time. So I want a real free flowing back and forth discussion and then to sort of signal that the group is over and wrap it up, I would ask them to go around one at a time and tell me something important to remember. Uh, if I could make a focus group like that work with a particular set of participants and a good starting question, um, wow, I would be really happy to do that. Uh, but it would be fairly different as a way of doing focus groups. You know, you would, when you wrote it up, you would have to describe that you did something different. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say about that is if you're thinking about working in the field of focus groups where people hire you to do focus groups, um, they won't pay you to do that. They hire moderators and they think moderators are going to be very active and that you're going to be working for them and doing something for that pay. And if all you do is bring together the right people and ask them the right question, that won't get recognized as uh, you know, pay for hire kind of moderating. Uh, so there are different worlds of focus groups out there. Um, I think I saw, you know, I, I have to say that years ago, and this is going to sound bad, um, I taught a course for international students. It's 20 years ago, okay? And I can't remember, there were students from four former Soviet socialist republics. And I can't remember whether the one group was from Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. So I apologize for not knowing the difference. But one of them had done a group on tea drinking. And they wanted uh, Western European people wanted to see if they could import their tea and sell it uh, to this newly opened market. And so the question was, uh, how do you uh, get people to talk about tea drinking? And if you're going to be that kind of a moderator and get hired to do uh, focus groups, they expect you to be an active, in charge, in control moderator. In social sciences, we seldom do it that way. We really want to back off and let the participants tell us their story. And so I'm interested in exploring what I call participant-centered approaches and less structured interviews so that we really give them more control over the interview and don't have to worry about ourselves as a moderator. That makes sense. So you can tell me, do you drink a lot of tea in Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan? I got to say it right. Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan? Do y'all drink a lot of tea? Yeah. 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 <laughs> more coffee or more tea? <laughs> All right. It must have been Uzbekistan. No tea. Yeah. No tea. <laughs> Some. Not, no, not tea drinkers. Some. Okay. All right. <laughs> so you had asked me to talk about doing things differently in focus groups, and that's kind of the agenda that I used. And hopefully uh, that also reveals something about the common ways of doing them. Uh, so if what's different is kind of in contrast to what's routine, we uh, sort of covered both of that here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do, do you have thoughts or questions? Yeah. All right. Professor, I have one question about, um, have you ever used uh, art-based interview in your focus group? And if yes, is it uh, useful or, and informative? Uh, what kind of uh, interview? Maybe you could ask Anna. It's the question of the volume because the microphone is in front of her. Sure. 
Okay, so I, I think the general idea is, have you ever used arts, arts uh, oh. part of the focus group, right? And is it useful or how so or not? I know people are experience, experimenting with that and there's sort of two ways of doing it. One is uh, as a form of what we call stimulus material. So you would pass out uh, forms of art or show photos or something like that as a stimulus for the participants to respond to. The other thing is to ask the participants to create some art. One thing that's sometimes done that way is if you're familiar with a collage where you take something like a mag several magazines and cut up pictures and paste them together to make a composite image. We have done things like that and uh, just to describe something a little different there, uh, what I like to do is if we, you know, maybe had six people in the focus group, I would break them into two teams of three and have them each create a collage and then show the collage to the other group and then talk about the similarities and differences in what they created. Um, the one reason I think people use collages is, is that you don't have to have a lot of artistic skill to create one. Okay. Um, the other thing we sometimes do is to have uh, individuals make drawings and tell stories about their drawings. And then we say that most of us don't have artistic skills. Don't worry about that. And I always say, in my case, I can barely draw stick figures, okay? So uh, I don't, you know, I, I feel I can put people at ease about not having artistic skills because I don't have any. But then each person has like a piece of paper and you ask them to draw a picture that they can tell a story about. And then each person tells a story from their picture and then they react to the things that are sort of uh, similar and different about their pictures. Now, in that case, I don't know that we so much collect the art material as art as we use it again as a way of stimulating discussion. But uh, I would collect the pictures for sure. And if somebody had a particularly interesting picture that had a good story to go with it, I might include it in my report. Um, but it's, it's an emerging area, I think, in general in uh, social science data collection. And that's the ways that I've seen it used in focus groups so far. Great. So, the way we do those uh, draw a picture, they're almost always as one person who's really good. And, yeah. then, <laughs> and everybody else in the group gets kind of a good uh, laugh out of that. They put up their picture and it's, you know, really high quality drawing and everybody will say, oh no, mine looks so bad compared to yours. So that's another yeah, fun like, aspect to it, the variation in the skills people have. Oh, okay. All right. So, all right. All right. So you can see. Right? Okay. All right. Do you want to tell me? Uh, okay. Uh, in sur when we do surveys, it, it says like to choose randomly the respondents randomly, it will be more reliable. Can you say that heterogeneous focus groups is more reliable than homogeneous? Ah. Mm -hmm. So to talk about reliability oh, yeah. within the focus group itself, right? So is heterogeneous? Would you argue? Could you argue one way or another that heterogeneous or homogeneous is more reliable? Uh, no. I think of it as uh, more useful or uh, more productive. The problem with thinking about reliability or comparing to surveys is that we're working with such small ends in focus groups that we really uh, can't assess any uh, thing that borders on statistics. So if we're working with only 30 people, we can't really assess reliability in any technical sense. Instead, it's a matter of a more uh, subjective criterion of what produces a good discussion. And what is it that really gets them to talk about the material that is uh, interesting and useful for you? And so, if we think about, let's say we did uh, two different kinds of teachers, we would do in a homogeneous groups, we do them separately and then compare what they had to say. In the mixed groups, we'd hear them talking back and forth. And 
We just don't know which would work better. We know we'd get good, lively conversations if we separated them, but we may not hear as much about the comparison as we would like, because each one is just sort of talking about their own views and experiences. Whereas if we had them mixed, they might actually be actively comparing them in ways that would be really interesting if the discussion got uh, lively and successful. But we just don't know right now. Great, thank you. Okay. Maybe we have time for another one or two questions. I had one other thing and I, I just lost it, but it was, I'm gonna come back to it. Let's see, anyone else? Clarify? When you're writing it up? When you're trying to find the findings? Okay. All right. So, for the, uh, okay. So, it, in particular, if you have a heterogeneous group, and so now you have different types of people and around a common topic, and then you try to write your report, how do you talk about the findings? So, each person, let's say they all say something different in this case. Mm -hmm. What's the. Yeah the common other than they all say something different. <laughs> right. Well, you can- Do you what, accept all the responses or el eliminate some? Okay. Well, what you're hoping to find are systematic differences. So that one kind of teacher says one thing and a different kind of teacher says a different thing. I mean, literally, I know you guys have been working on statistics lately. And so you'll be looking for, uh, gee, I hesitate to call it an analysis of variance or a t-test where you'd see some different central tendency in each group or some pattern of covariation where the more a person was like this, the more they'd be likely to say that. But logically, those are kinds of things that we look at in everyday life, not just in statistics. So. We, you know, what we're always looking for, I think, in qualitative stuff when we write it up is patterns. Now, I like to summarize those patterns as themes myself. And so I'm going to look at the, my way of writing up the qualitative research is probably saying something like, there were four basic themes in the data. And if I were looking at mixing two different kinds of groups, and that's probably what I do to start with, is to not mix a whole lot of different kinds of people. If we don't know much about mixing, let's start with the simpler approach. But I might say there were four basic differences, or there were two key similarities and three basic differences, or something like that. But I would try to sort it out into similarities and differences, and hopefully we don't get to the point where everybody says something different. I mean, our intuition as researchers for bringing people together like that would be that there would be some interesting differences. Okay, so I'd like to hear how people in this situation talk about it versus people in that situation. And that's what I would be aiming for, is to find some interesting similarities and differences and that's why I would design the research that way, and that's how I would uh, orient the analysis. Great. Thank you. I think uh, one kind of final question. So in the course as a whole right now, we're looking at, we're trying to understand the values in Kazakhstan, so currently what these values are, and then thinking about can that relate to research methods, and are we, with it, the concept being that we've heard in the past and other people have been kind of pushed on it and we know that research methods in general have been developed in a Western context. So perhaps there's a different way of doing research for different contexts. Right. And so I proposed this at, at one, at a conference that we just had, a, a, you know, a higher education leadership forum. And we got pushed back from one person who said, why are you trying to do anything different? This other stuff already works. And so this goes, <laughs> emergent already right why do it 
you're just not, you're not asking the right questions maybe, right? You're not doing enough interviews. You haven't tried enough, right? Why mm. then break out of the box? And so this is the, what's the yeah. point, right? So to you, right? So why be emergent? Right. Why well, be emergent? what I would say is something about cultural context, okay? Right now, you guys are all sitting in a seminar room, talking to a talking head, um, you know, you're all socialized into the ability to do that. But I'm guessing that for the vast majority of people in your country, it would be totally, you know, strange, okay? And so what I would ask is, for something like focus groups, when do people come together in group discussions? And for people who are more educated and working in business and industry, maybe it is pretty much like a Western format. Uh, I'll give you a specific example. When we do them, it's probably in a room like you're in now with a table and everyone sits around it. Uh, it turns out for whatever reason in Britain, they developed very differently and they preferred to do them in people's living rooms. So what would it be like if you were to say, where do ordinary people in the course of their ordinary life gather? Would it make sense to bring people together in a living room, in a classroom, over dinner? Uh, you know, when do people get together and talk about the kinds of things that you want to talk about in your focus group? So it has to be, you know, something where people really feel comfortable talking about the topic to each other. And I think focus groups adapt well from culture to culture, but if you're out in a rural village, you're probably not gonna do it the same way you do it in a uh, graduate uh, level university. And that's really probably true anywhere. And the more contrast there is between rural and urban, high and low education, things like that, the more you have to take that context into account and say, you know, what will be workable and comfortable for these people talking about this topic? So does that help? Yeah, that's great. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so All right. much. Well, I know you're almost done with the course, so wrap up well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Really appreciate your time. Really informative. Okay. Good. I'm glad you're doing this. Bye. 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 Thanks.